Okay. I do believe we're good to we're go, on. Martin. We're on, yeah. <laughs> Hello, so, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Hi there. We'll just do a quick sound check. Uh, a gentleman in the audience at the front said that when we were chatting, it seemed to be duller, the sound. So, I mean, you can hear me because everybody can, they can hear me in York. <laughs> um, but I think we're all right, are we? I can don't know. Hear properly? Can, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Put your hand up if we you can't hear be, me. We don't want to be too loud. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, folks, well, we are going to, uh, we've been cooking, we're going to be cooking for the next three, four days, doing all sorts of things with um, kitchen garden produce. And yeah. this is, this one's a bit wacky. So you've come to the one that's completely off the wall. If you are uh, prepared, for, be prepared for the unexpected. We're paying <laughs> homage to that great designer. Absolutely. Vivian Westwood. Yeah, Vivian Westwood. We, we're, we're doing something a little bit different. We are going to build our dessert on here. Okay? So just give that a good wipe. But we're, we're basically, that's going to be our dessert. But before we get to dessert, Martin, we have to do main course. All right. Excellent. So, yeah. Sounds so good. we've got some new potatoes bubbling away here. Jersey Royals? Um, sadly not. <laughs> sadly not. But we're going to make them into Alforno potatoes. That's the plan. So to put with our potatoes, we are going to serve them with some uh, lamb cutlets. Mm. Now, I've got some Dale's lamb here, bought from Fodder just over the road, Fodder Farm Shop. This is actually a rack of lamb. But I'm going to cut it into cutlets. So, it's beautiful Dale's lamb, this. Really, really happy with it. So, I'm just going to give that a good smack down, make them all a nice shape, and then lightly season them with a little bit of salt. My neighbor's a sheep farmer, and uh Steph uses the lamb, um, and I use what comes out the back of them on my vegetables. So we have a good relationship with the farm. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And we've also got here, folks, some rose harissa, oh. which is a fantastic um, spice mix, which I'm going to pop on there as well. Just to marinate the lamb. The reason I chose this one is because it's very sort of bright red and the idea being it's punk and, uh, and everything. So uh, it, goes, it goes very well with what we're doing. So I will not cross-contaminate that, don't worry. I'm going to pop my lamb into a hot pan. getting there just give it a few seconds we're going to use some Yorkshire rapeseed oil these guys are here today and we're going to serve our um, our lamb cutlets Debs could I have a couple of pans saucepans yeah thanks get a bit of a satisfying sizzle there that's what we want get those sizzling off in the pan so all that's been used. Just keep that out of the way. Quick wash of the hands. We'll get on with our potatoes. You know, Jersey Royals have a quite a distinct taste. Do you know how they get the taste? No, no. The reason Jersey Royals taste so different is that what they mulch or manure the land with is seaweed. I never knew that. And that's what gives it its unique flavor. So everybody who buys a Jersey Royal seed potato to grow, you'll never get the same flavor unless you've got access to seaweed to mix in <coughs> to your compost or your compost bin. So that's why, that's why it tastes the way it does. Wow. If you want to buy the seed potato, it's never labeled as Jersey Royal. You can't find it anywhere. But the potato that they use to create Jersey Royals is International Kidney. 
So if you remember international kidney, that is the potato that they use on Jersey as Jersey Royals, and then they manure it, uh, feed it with uh, seaweed. That brings its distinct flavor. You know what? I love a Jersey Royal. It's, it's like different times of year, isn't it? Mm. You know, like asparagus season. We're, we're doing asparagus later today. Um, but certain times of the year as a chef, I think it's really exciting. And, and yeah. that's a great time. When you see that, I always buy some. Always. Okay, folks, you will notice in the pan, I didn't move the lamb around. I kept it nice and steady because... I want to see a nice golden brown color. That's what I want. That's flavor. And it really upsets me when people push food around in a pan because it never gets that golden brown color on it. Okay, so my lamb cutlets are going in the oven. And I'm going to serve with my lamb cutlets. <laughs> Got a couple of things happening here. So, We've got here some chorizo. I've peeled it, peeled the skin off, and I'm popping it into my frying pan. I love this stuff. The smoked paprika, and then there's this stuff. And this stuff is like the Rolls Royce of smoked paprika. Mm. Smell that, Martin. Wow, that's gorgeous. It's boom. Yeah. But don't make the mistake I did once and get the one with three chilies on it. That's only a mistake you make once. <laughs> okay, so they're frying off, happy with that. We've got here some garlic chives from our lovely friends at Rudding, Rudding Park. Gonna give that a quick chop. And we've also got some Calvo Nero. What's your, what's your thoughts about this, Martin? Well, I mean, originally, Kale, I, my neighbour's a sheep farmer, as I mentioned, and um, I said to him, oh, I'm going to grow some kale. And he says, farmers only grow kale for livestock. It used to be grown as a fodder crop, a livestock crop. Uh, so he said, I won't be eating that. He said, it's tough as old boots. It's how you, I guess, how you prepare it, but it's a really popular but highly nutritional uh, vegetable. And it's easy to grow. And ironically... Um, the slugs don't like it as much, and the pigeons tend to leave it alone. Do they? So, yeah, generally speaking, the, the kale is, is a fairly durable crop. So it's well worth, if you like greens, strong greens, then they, they are good. Now, this is a variety of mint I've never seen before called red mint. Red mint, yeah. There, there's, if you go into the plant hall, obviously when we finish cooking, um, <laughs> If you go in there, there are a couple of herb nurseries. One has got a stand that all mints. It's, I think it's called 50 Shades of Mint. I love it. Something like I love that. it. I love it. Lots and lots of different flavors. Um, and I love mint, uh, but I always grow them in pots because they can be a little bit excitable. They tend to charge you around your garden a bit. So don't plant them direct in the soil. Plant them in pots. Every year, I knock it out of the pot, split the plant from the outside, take five clumps from the outside, pot them up, give three away, keep two, the scent of it, compost heat, because it's all burnt out and rubbishy. So just redo it every year and you'll find you'll have lovely fresh mint and it won't be romping all over your garden. Okay, Martin, well, we've got our potatoes cooked. We've got our chorizo, nice and... The oil is coming out of the chorizo, and that's what I wanted. I wanted it to start to sort of taint the potato and give it that flavor. And then I'm going to add my smoky paprika. I can't, I can't pick this up without having a sniff. <laughs> oh. What is it, half a teaspoon? Yeah, that's a, I would say, yeah. You know, I'm the same in gardening. When people say, you mix in a compost or put in feed on, they say how much. I say, oh, so much. And it's the same in the kitchen, isn't it, chef? We you, don't, you know, just. We don't, do, we don't mess about, do we? We just, yeah, boom. <laughs> so a pinch, okay. pinch of salt depends on what size your hands are, I guess, but anyway. So I've got here some yogurt, and I've added the mint into the yogurt. I've also got the garlic chives. I'm going to pop those in as well. Right. So my sauce, that's my sauce for my lamb. 
a little bit of salt. That's ready. Nice, simple sauce, ideal for uh, springtime, summertime with the lamb. The lamb will be ready, which it is. How do we know it's ready? I can see some tiny droplets of blood on the top of the lamb, so I know it's ready. Another thing you can do is you can give it a squeeze. You see chefs and they do this all the time. That one is ready. That one needs a minute longer. Right, just pop that back in. And when we squeeze things like the, the meat like that, what we're looking for is we're looking for, oops, right, let's get sorted. We're there. What we're looking for is that springability. So when you, it's a bit like steak, exactly the same as steak. You know, when you, you see people, and we always teach chefs, that's well done. If you feel it on your hand, that's what well done should feel like. That's medium, and that's rare. Or well, some people do it that way, but it works both ways. Okay, so our Alforno potatoes are ready. Our kale is cooked and ready. Our lamb is resting. Let's plate up our dish. I'm, I'm quite excited about the next one, Martin. <laughs> Quite excited and slightly nervous, <laughs> especially for the, the two ladies on the front row there in the, it, yeah. and the gentleman there, they're in the firing line. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it could go everywhere. I think, have we got any bibs around the back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bibs for the front row. Oh. Right, so we're gonna pop our uh, chorizo on there, our potatoes in there. And that smoky flavor, I'll just leave that under there. I'll g then you can have a taste later. My lamb should be ready now. Happy with that. So what we're wanting to do is take our lamb and use the bones in a way that makes it look a bit more interesting, like so. Then we're going to take our kale. Just make sure it's good. Tastes lovely. Just remind us what went in the kale, Steph. All I did was a little bit of uh, butter and oil and a little bit of salt. That was it. That's it. Gorgeous green colour, isn't it? It's such a I strong, love it. Yeah. It's one of those vegetables. I think it's a real marmite veg. Love it, hate it. Half yeah. of us love it. Half of us cannot stand it. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a little bit of the rose harissa oil. I'm going to sprinkle that around because then I'm going to take my yogurt, garlic, chive, mint, and I'm going to dot that around as well. So we're using everything, okay? Look at this, I love it. Martin's got me a little gift. He's a very generous man, is Martin. What have we got here, sir? It's my grandma's mint. Your grandma's mint? <laughs> yeah, it's wow. been, it was my grandma's, then my mum got it. And I've, uh, it's been passed to me to look after, so. And it's a really, just a strong mint. Smells mind-blowing. So, Let's just yeah. chop a little bit on the top. You can't have lamb without mint, can you? No, you can't. It's like strawberries without cream. It's just not allowed. There we go with grandma's mint all over it. Fantastic. <laughs> That's our first dish, folks. Quick wash of the hands. Now we're going to make our second dish. So first thing we need to do is cook some rhubarb. And I'm going to do it two different <coughs> ways. Now, Martin, there's all sorts of different rhubarb, isn't there? You can yeah, there is. It's quite a difficult thing to grow or easy. I mean, it's really easy to grow in the garden, but if you want young, fresh, early stems, you've got to force it. And you can, 
you use uh, some sort of container over the top. And if you want to be really posh, you'll buy a clay rhubarb porcelain with a little lid on. Buy your cow between 50 and 100 quid a piece. Debs. Yeah. I'm a Yorkshireman and I ain't going to pay that for a rhubarb porcelain. So what I did is I, uh, I have a spare Dalek composting bin. You know the ones that are shaped like a funnel, black with a lid on? I had one of them kicking around in the nursery, so I thought, I'll stick that over the rhubarb. Absolutely perfect. So, and it cost Save me, yourself a few quid. It cost me note. I mean, <laughs> okay, it doesn't look like a clay, fancy clay forcer, but it works really, really well. <clears throat> We're using forced rhubarb. <clears throat> Anybody I've, been? I've got a chimney at home, and I wondered right. if, you know, like the pot of a chimney, and I wondered if that would make a good yeah, rhubarb. Yeah, just put something over the top. Just yeah. put a plate over the top, a saucer or something, something fairly heavy. Uh, you'll have been to the uh, the rhubarb festivals in uh, in Wakefield. I have, yeah. And I've, I've, I've stood in a shed, what knee deep in place. mud. Yeah. And it's true what they say, Martin. You can hear it crack. It talks to you, does rhubarb? Yeah, it does. It so. does talk to you. It's amazing stuff. When it's forcing, it sort of squeaks. It's a real strange sensation, isn't it? You, you go in there, and the sheds. The only light they use, because it's going to be kept dark, is candles. <clears throat> so there's candles everywhere, and then. All of a sudden, you get inside the shed and the rhubarb starts squeaking, and it's, it's a bit strange, really. <clears throat> but it's gorgeous. It's, the I, reason you force it is it makes it a lot sweeter, less sharp. So it's a, a great, great thing. And you can do so much with rhubarb. It's an amazing, uh, amazing is it a thing. Fruit or a vegetable? It's actually a vegetable. Now, guys, we've got here. Um, so I've got some rhubarb in a pan with some sugar that I'm going to stew down. I've also got some rhubarb stems, and these are two different types of rhubarb. This one, I think one of them's strawberry, and right. I don't know what the other one is, but yep. they're very different looking, aren't they? The they look like one chalk and cheese. As well, I think so. Could be that, <laughs> you, you could be right. And I've got here some rose lemonade. I'm just going to pour a little bit on, and I'm going to stick a lid and get it in the oven. The reason I'm doing it two different ways is this one, I want it to mush. That one, I want it to stay as nice stems. So we, what we're doing, Martin, um, is we're gonna make some meringue. Debs, if you wow. can hear me, can you bring round the meringue, Debs? Right, so that's the lamb, isn't it? Right, so we're making Basically, we're going to build a rhubarb punk-inspired dessert on there. Punk and petals, yeah. a la Vivian Westwood. What's not to love? I'm sure she would have been, she would be impressed. Yeah, absolutely. She would, have, she would have been impressed, definitely. So what we're going to do with our dessert is we're going to make a meringue. Um, now, I've pre-done this partly because I had to because... It does take a while to cook. So I've got my meringue here, and I've got some s little um, sticks of meringue, and I've got some big, um, like, big pieces of meringue, okay? Meanwhile, the rhubarb is stewing. We might even put a tiny splash of the rose lemonade in there. Why not? And we're going to whip up our cream. So we're going to make a Chantilly style cream. So I've got some cream here. You know what we do throughout the show is we try and <coughs> showcase not only locally grown and sourced uh, food ingredients, but also some of the ones that are around the hall here, so uh, you'll probably pick up on some of the ingredients we're using and you'll be able to buy them in here, whether it's the, the drink that goes into the beer or the, yeah. the wine or the rapeseed oil, you know, you can get most of these fairly local. I'm going to let you talk for a minute, Martin, while <laughs> well, I do this. Well, you're whisking. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we tend to use all sorts of things for garnishing and, and one of the trends at the moment, and particularly uh, poignant for pumpkin petal is how to use <coughs> different things to dress it up and just to finish it off properly. Um, 
And no, I'm not going to a wedding this weekend. This is a, a carnation. Um, it's a carnation that uh, you can eat. All carnations, you can eat the petals. You don't eat the green bit, uh, but the petals of carnations and dianthus have a clovey scent, a slightly citrusy clovey scent. So these are going to play a part in our uh, <coughs> in our display and give you a hint of uh, <coughs> of a different flavour and taste. Because this is about a visual experience as well as a taste experience. So the idea is for us to put all these components together. <laughs> Are these easy to grow? Yeah, fairly easy. A uh, little bit early for them in the garden, but you buy young plants in the spring of the year, start them off in a greenhouse in a pot, and then grow them in a container, bob them outside later on in the season, and they'll flower round about August time, start to flower August, um, and uh, really good for cutting for the garden. Uh, and also, if you feel a bit peckish, you can pull the petals off and eat, eat the petals. The great thing about it is whether you're using violas or carnations or primroses, they add a very subtle, generally flowers have got a very faint scent of the, uh, the plant of origin. So they've got a citrusy taste of uh, uh, violas. Rosemary is about to flower in the garden. You'll find that rosemary has little purple flowers on. Can you eat them? Absolutely. What do they taste of? Rosemary, surprisingly, faintly of rosemary, but they taste of rosemary, and so many plants are like that. We, uh, we try to use them to just add a bit of a distinction to it. It's a very in thing at the moment, uh, whereas you used to just sprinkle a few herbs on. Now it's great to zhuzh them up a little bit and add a little bit of colour. These uh, violas that you see on this stand here are all edible. The flowers, not the foliage. Uh, and they're grown from plants that were started in the autumn. <coughs> Excuse me, they, they were started in the autumn, grown on in a polytunnel. Um, two weeks before the show, I take all the flowers off, give them a liquid feed, it's just Ooh. a tomato feed. And then they uh, literally, within two weeks, voila, full of flowers. Key to growing any plant that flowers, take the fading flowers off uh, and feed it and it will continue because it's trying to flower. And if you take the flowers off, it's trying to seed. If you take the dead flowers off, it will continue to start to throw flowers till it exhausts itself. A bit tricky to propagate these, but I tend to buy new plugs every year because it's a lot easier. And find with things like violas, they do suffer from molds and fungal attack. They get an um, right, uh, uh, awful disease called Rhizoctonian phytophthora, which is like a, a mildewy type thing and a root, uh, a root disease. So I tend to uh, discard them, put them on a compost heap and get new plugs or seed, grow them from seed. And it's often a lot easier. You know, gardening can be tough. So you really need to make it so that it's easy for you. And if you're struggling with something, think how you can shortcut that. If you haven't got a heated greenhouse, don't worry about trying to grow things that need protection. Just get new ones the following year. And if you shop around, you can pick them up fairly cheap. Now, folks, whilst... Uh I think tomorrow I might whip the cream ready. <laughs> okay, so we've got here some Chantilly cream, which is just double cream, a little bit of vanilla, and um, a little bit of sugar. That's all. So just going to pop that into my piping bag. And then we're going to build our dessert, Martin. Wow. Sounds exciting. <laughs> Are you all ready for this? <laughs> OK. So our rhubarb that was in the pan is now lovely and cooked and soft. And our rhubarb that's in the oven is pretty much the same, I think, by now. A little bit longer, not long. And I also made, <laughs> so we've got our Chantilly cream We've got some rhubarb curd. Wow. And I made <laughs> some rhubarb ginger beer jelly. 
so. So if you don't like rhubarb. This is not the <laughs> dessert for you. If you don't like rhubarb, you've absolutely had it. <laughs> but we're in, we're in Yorkshire, we all yeah. like rhubarb. <laughs> Hope, could hopefully. You, could you substitute that for something like strawberries? Yeah, this would be brilliant with strawberries, brilliant with raspberries. Yeah. Um, all sorts. Yeah, just a bit of fun, really. So we've got our rhubarb jelly. I'm just going to use half. And pop that back for tomorrow. We've got our meringue. So we're going to use three of these. And we're going to use some of the sticks as well. Uh, did you demonstrate this in your kitchen? Did you, have, you, have you done a bit of a dry run, Steph? This is, what? now years ago, I did something called Great British Menu on BBC Two a long time ago. It must be 10 years ago I did it, but I did a rhubarb dessert. And Nigel Howarth, who was my judge, I had Nigel Howarth one year and I had Jason Atherton another year. Nigel Howarth looked at me and he thought I'd lost the plot, but afterwards yeah. he said, actually, it tastes really good. And it's a bit of a play on that, right. is this. So it's a bit of fun. So what we're gonna do, Martin, you're going to assist, hopefully, if that's oh. all right. Oh. But the yeah. first thing I need to do is I need to do something a bit punky on our, uh, on our dish here. So we have got some rhubarb syrup. We've got some raspberry sauce, and we've got some mango sauce. So Here we go. Are you all ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to go for it. OK? Whoa. Right. Hope you'll all try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> then we've got our mango. The kids would love this, wouldn't they? It's just a bit of fun. Wow. But it will look good when it's done. Right, OK. Then we've got our rhubarb syrup, which we're just going to drizzle around. Okay, and um, we're going to carry on building our dessert. So we've got our rhubarb. So our stems, that's very hot, Deb. Our stems of rhubarb are going to go on. Okay. So I guess this is something. Uh, uh, do you like it or hate it? I think it's one of those things. It's a bit of fun, really. We're not taking life too seriously, are we, Martin? Never do. Never do. <laughs> so, yeah. So, finishing. So you can see all the rhubarb around. Now, of course, this rhubarb is red hot, so I can't put it in with my jelly in my stack because it would just disintegrate. It smells amazing. But I'm hoping you're all going to have a taste and have a try. Does anybody not like rhubarb? <laughs> <laughs> Unlucky. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't, you've really had it. Yeah. Then I'm going to pop some of this around where I'm going to build my Okay. <laughs> Let me go get some strawberries. So then, on the bottom rung, we're going to put the rhubarb jelly. Okay? So that's going on. Next thing we're going to do, we've got our cream. We're going to pop another one on. 
So if you've, if you've ever had a Wolves Vionetta, <laughs> <laughs> A little bit more cream. That's my kind of sandwiches, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This rhubarb's, uh, it's a bit warm. Um, I'm going to use blueberries instead, okay? Just for a bit of, because these are cold. Oh, whoops. Oh, me jelly. <laughs> Come on. Come on, you can do it. Then dot a few of these around the outside, like so. Is it going to move? Uh, I think it's all right. Then we've got our rhubarb curd. <laughs> so rhubarb curd around. Maybe even a bit drizzled over the blueberries. <laughs> then the lid goes on. <laughs> it's like we're creating a monster. And now we did promise you some petals. So I'm hoping, <laughs> Sue, Sue and Martin, we, we discussed this, and I said, let's do this thing on the table in the front, and they both looked at me like I was, yeah. But it's a bit of fun, a bit of fun. <laughs> so we got the meringue. That will do. There we go. And we've got some praline, so this is nuts, hazelnuts. They're going to go around. And a few on top. And this, this is like a, uh, a creme fraiche red wine gel. Oh, wow. A little bit of that over the top. And then last but not least, Martin, we've got to go. You go for it, sir. Go go on. On. I love it. I love it. We've got violas. What have you got there, Martin? These are, these are the carnation petals. You can eat the carnation petals. These have got like a, a bit of a clovey taste to them. This is what it's all about, pumpkin petals. A bit of fun at the, uh, at the Harrogate Flower Show today. Last drizzle of the curd. I can go to a wedding later now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good, Martin, aren't we? We're good to go, are we just about? It looks pretty cool. So, ladies and gentlemen, just to recap, we made our Yorkshire Dale Slam from fodder. We served it with our forno potatoes and some kale. We made a garlic chive and natural yogurt uh, fresh mint dressing. And we served the rose harissa from the lamb side. And then we decided to go a bit crazy with rhubarb. And we did a rhubarb pumpkin petals Vivian Westwood inspired dessert that we basically layered rhubarb jelly, rhubarb curd, rhubarb gel, rhubarb syrup with raspberry syrup and uh, mango and praline and lots of edible flowers. Mm. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> I've got to get a picture with this. <laughs> you want to go to the center or? Sue, would you take a picture? Just, Just right I'm going gonna, gonna to cut it for you, sir, in a minute. Sue, would you take a picture? Can we? Can we be in it? So yeah, I'll just jump down here. Yay.